Right. Actually, I can start now. Hello, I'm Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Thank you for attending our webinar, The New Western History 40 Years On, which is part of the AHA Colloquium series of Virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support Virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the AHA or if you're already a member, making a donation today. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A feature to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but we'll need to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation on, on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. And finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording on YouTube. I'll now turn things over to the chair of our session today, Lynn Hudson from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks for laying out those rules. And welcome again, everybody. We're very excited to have you all here. Um, as Debbie said, I'm Lynn Hudson from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And we are going to engage in, I'm sure, will be a very lively conversation about the new Western history 40 years on. Now, before I introduce our distinguished panelists, I want to remind you again that after a series of questions that I'll be posing to the panel, we'll be interested in your questions questions that you can post in the Q&A. So uh, we'll be continuing the conversation and look forward to your questions. So let me get started with the introductions. I'll be introducing folks in the order that they appeared in the program with the important addition of Maria Montoya, who unfortunately whose name did not get into the program. So first up, Anne Hyde. Anne Hyde is a professor of history at the University of Oklahoma. She was born in St. Louis and raised in Reno, Nevada and specializes in indigenous history, race, and family history. Since 2016, she served as the editor-in-chief of the Western Historical Quarterly. Her 2012 book, Empires, Nations, and Families, A History of the North American West, 1800 to 1860, won the Bancroft Prize and was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Before going to Oklahoma, Anne taught at Colorado College for two decades and directed the Race and Ethnic Studies Program, the Hulbert Center for Southwest Studies, and the Crown Faculty Development Center. She has served as the president of the Pacific Coast Branch of the AHA and as faculty director of the AHA's Tuning Project and co-editor of the Dictionary of American Biography. Her most recent books are Shaped by the West, A History of North America, published by University of California Press in 2018, and Due from Norton later this year, a book about intermarriage and cultural mixing, mixing on North American frontiers, Born of Lakes and Plains, Mixed Descent Families, and the Making of the American West. Next up, we have Patricia Limerick. Kathy Limerick is the faculty director and chair of the board of the Center of the American West at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she is also a professor of history. Among her many publications, she's perhaps best known for her 1987 work, Legacy of Conquest, which I'm sure many of you know, was a central text to the formation of what came to be called New Western History. In 2000, 2000, sorry, Patty published her collection of essays, Something in the Soil, which included the essay, Dancing with Professors, The Trouble with Academic Prose, endearing her to copy editors around the globe and so many of us. In 2012, she published A Ditch in Time, The City, the West, and Water, the History of Water in Denver. And I'm sorry, but I just have to quote the Denver Post here that said, historian Patricia Lim Nelson Limerick has done the impossible. She's made a history of the Denver Water Department interesting, end quote. <laughs> Limerick has served as president of the Organization of American Historians, the American Studies Association, the Western Historical Association, and the Society of American Historians. And as she was vice president of the teaching division of the AHA, where she co-wrote a successful proposal to the Lumina Foundation on tuning the historical profession's teaching efforts. Among her many awards and prizes and honors, she's been the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship and the Hazel Barnes prize, which is CU Boulder's highest award for teaching and research. Most recently, as in last week, Patty Limerick was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in recognition of her ability to bridge the gap between the academy and the general public and her skills at applying a historical perspective to contemporary conflicts and dilemmas. 
Joshua Reed is a registered member of the Snohomish Indian Nation and an Associate Professor of American Indian Studies and the John Calhoun Smith Memorial Endowed Associate Professor of History at the University of Washington, Seattle, where he's also the director of the Center for the Study of the Pacific Northwest. Josh's first book, The Sea is My Country, The Maritime World of the Macaws, was published in 2015 in the Henry Rowe Cloud series on American Indians and modernity. It has received awards and acknowledgments from the OAH, the American Society for Ethnohistory, the Western Historical Association, and the North American Society for Oceanic History. Reed also edits the Emil and Kathleen Six series on Western history and biography with UW Press and the Rowe Cloud series on American Indians and modernity. He serves on the editorial advisory board of the Pacific Northwest Quarterly, is a distinguished speaker for the Western Historical Association, History Association, sorry, and member of the board of the National Council for History Education. His current research focuses on indigenous explorers in the Pacific from the late 18th century to the end of the 19th century, and is, he's completing an edited volume on indigenous communities and violence. Maria Montoya is an associate professor of history at New York University and the Dean of Arts and Sciences at NYU Shanghai, where she's also the Global Network Associate Professor. She's the author of Translating Property, the Maxwell Land Grant and the Conflict Over Land in the American West, 1840 to 1900, published by UC Press in 2002, as well as numerous articles on the history of the American West, environmental history, labor and Latinx history. Marie is the lead author on the US history textbook, Global Americans, a Social and Global History of the United States. Currently, she's completing her latest book, Fighting for the Fringe, Three Industrialists, Their Workers, and Employee Benefits, 1909 to 1950, which focuses on John D. Rockefeller, Josephine Roche, and Henry Kaiser, and their roles in defining the spheres of work and home life during the early 20th century. And last but certainly not least is Louis Warren, who is the W. Turrentine Jackson Professor of U.S. Western History in the Department of History at UC Davis. He's the author of God's Red Sun, The Ghost Dance Religion and the Making of Modern America, published in 2017 by Basic Books, and Buffalo Bill's America, William Cody and the Wild West Show, which was published in 2003 by Knopf and won multiple awards, including the Albert Beveridge Prize of the AHA, Cowley, Cowley Western History Association Prize, the Great Plains Distinguished Book Prize, and the Western Writers of America Spur Award. Louis is the author of numerous articles, including Cody's Last Stand, Masculine Anxiety, The Custer Myth, and The Frontier of Domesticity in Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, and Wage Work in the Sacred Circle, The Ghost Dance as Modern Religion, both of which won the Oscar Winther Award for the best article published in the WHQ. Among his many, many awards and prizes, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for Research on God, God's Red Sun, and in 2018-19, he was the R. Stanton Avery Distinguished Fellow at the Huntington Library. So with that, I am getting ready to turn it over to our distinguished panelists and start our conversation. So let's begin. So since our round table is called New Western History 40 Years On, we thought we might start with a question about looking backward. So my question to the panel first is what lesson or lessons can we take from the stormy past of new Western history. And I will have Anne start us off. Thanks, Lynn. Um, and I very much appreciate the chance to think about this field, the US West, um, and very much appreciate the, the new Western history's debate over where we are and what our actual bucket is. And you know, one of one of the things that came out of this debate, you know, 40 years on, is that it's a big bucket, but it's a leaky bucket. Mm -hmm. So you you know, you think you have a handle on what's in it, but it tips over. There's some there's a hole in the bottom. You know, this is a very leaky bucket. And I and I think that's an advantage of this field. We're never gonna agree about what's inside the bucket, whether it includes borderlands, whether it's about frontiers, whether um, it's about just the U.S. West, you know, how we think about all of those regions. Because of the career I've had, I think a lot about state history as well. So, you know, what does it mean about is Western, are Western states part of Western history? So I think that's one of the questions as well. Um, and like everyone, I try to, I struggle to figure out what's in that bucket. 
Um, and in particular, what belongs in the Western Historical Quarterly? What, what constitutes questions that would be of interest to Western historians? And you know, this issue we have an article about West Virginia coal mining. Um, be, because it uses native names in a um, quite familiar Western way. So there are you know, all kinds of ways that the West spreads around. Um, but I was thinking about the thing that was the most characteristic about the new Western history. And I think it's irony. And irony is a really powerful tool, but it, it operates sort of like a, a private joke and it assumes that once you get the joke, you'll know better and you'll behave in some different way. There's all kinds of wonderful visual humor that came out of that. I think, and I really appreciate you. When you look at Legacy of Conquest, there are all these jokes in the images about bears and places that they shouldn't be, um, cans of oysters and places that they shouldn't be. So, you know, this, this visual joke is supposed to make you respond in a smart, humane way to that picture. Another good example of that, I think, is in um, Phil Deloria's, you know, Indians in Unexpected Places. And again, this is very layered humor. So, you know, the, the, the immediate humor is Indians shouldn't be in those places. But then you're supposed to laugh at yourself and take a step forward in terms of analysis and think about why that's unexpected. So I think that's pretty powerful. The assumption is that people would do something new after they discover that something is ironic. Um, sort of like progressive reformers or educators who you know, believe that people just need to know the facts. And once they know the facts, they'll do the right thing. And that made very much sense in that 1990s culture wars moment. But it seems quaintly optimistic right this minute. Now, to be fair, I could not get up in the morning if I didn't actually believe some of that. Um, but I don't think that irony works anymore. And so then I struggle to think about what we could replace it with. Um, so one, one example, so the problem of books and who reads what. So Western presses have a booming, booming market for Texas ranger heroes, heroic indigenous bad guys, heroic white bad guys, um, racist governors. And these are unapologetic books about you know, men who were of their era. So we don't have to excuse their behavior. And then all of those big selling books subsidize a much smaller range of academic books about the people that those Western heroes killed or lynched or drove off their land. But nobody reads both sets of books. So I, is that ironic? So, so I'm, I'm decided that maybe paradox is our way out of this. So holding two things that are both true at the same time. So it's the end of my little pitch and we can talk more about that. Well, can I, um, I think Michael Kamen was brilliant and he wrote the book, People of Paradox. So, and I didn't see what you, I didn't, how could I possibly ever know what you're gonna say next? Cause it's always interesting. I don't know what's gonna happen next, but now that you have said that, I think, well, that totally makes sense because I, in the public, excuse me, in the applied history world and communicating with wider audiences, I think I reached your same sense that the, I, but, uh, in a, in a much more critical way that with a public audience, that's not really on your side yet. Uh, the irony thing will be off putting and will seem smug to them and you should have stayed home. So I think I actually, I couldn't find my copy of People of Paradox by Michael Kamen uh, 15 years ago and it drove me wild and I ransacked everyone's bookshelves but I, I had to order a bad new edition of it. But Paradox worked really well because with Paradox, I didn't have to say, hypocrisy. I didn't have to say um, even inconsistency. I certainly didn't have to say lying and duplicity. I could just say, well, now that's interesting. Two things here coexisting. Uh, and they don't really, well, they're not in any way equivalent and they're in quite a dynamic relationship. But I really began dining out on paradox with county commissioners and <laughs> state legislators and so on. And I never really, thank you so much, because I just thought, 
oh, I always like Michael Cam. No wonder I'm enthusiastic. So that was fine. I live in a very personalized universe. Okay, Michael, yay, you're back with me now. So, but I really see what you're saying there because why did I make that shift so clearly of using the word paradox and celebrating that and telling young historians who wanted to do applied history use paradox. So I, I'm going to understand so much about myself by the time we're through here. This has just been spectacular to have this chance to think. Absolutely, irony, it's, it's brittle. It's tinny. It's got a kind of what you didn't say, but I know because I tried it a lot. Um, it's just the paradox allows you to be wholehearted and I don't know if it's welcoming, but something that irony doesn't work in that way. So thank you, Anne. Could I? Louis, thoughts? Yeah, I, I uh, the, the, issue of what we take from the stormy past of, of Western histories. Um, there's several other layers of sort of narration that go on when we talk about that past. Uh, one layer that comes up really quickly was these were the glory days of new Western history when the controversy erupted, right? And because, presumably because there was a lot of popular press coverage at uh, that, of that moment, um, uh, I also, th there's, there's more to that moment than the press coverage, obviously. That was a time, the, the 90s were a time when there were a lot of Western history jobs created in the academy. Um, there aren't a lot of any jobs being created in the academy now. There weren't actually a lot of jobs in the 90s. Either the 90s were very depressed for jobs too, if you look at the historical development of, of the profession. Um, but there were certainly more Western history jobs and more, more Western historians were hired into jobs that were advertised simply as American history in the way, same way that in the 70s and 80s, there had been quite a few Southern historians hired into jobs that were advertised as American history, where people said, wow, this is a really interesting field. And, and yeah, it's American history. Let's do this. Let's, let's go with this. Um, and I think that the, all the controversy around Western history seems to have been, in that sense, very generative, right, of, of something great in, in academic life, in the academic world. Um, I would say that the controversy itself, um, the, the, a lot of the time, uh, it, it strikes me that the two criticisms people made of the new Western history are similar to criticisms, criticisms people made of the West itself, historically. Right. One is um, there's nothing to see here, or at least nothing you want to see here. That that was one criticism. Right. It's either there's nothing new going on, or whatever's new is not worth looking at because it's that bad. You know, they're desecrating heroes or or what have you. Uh, don't look at it. Right. So don't don't go there. Is is one that was one approach, and the other is it's gone. The other is that the new Western history is over. Um, and that actually started really early. <laughs> I remember people talking about that in the mid nineties. And there was a, there's a conference in 1997, right? Where this became a major panel. Right? Is the new Western history uh, over? Do we really need to be doing Western history to understand the West? Can't we just do it as American history? Then we don't need the West at all as a region. It's, it's, it's vanished in importance which is very much like what people say about the frontier. Um, and I don't think that that's true, right? I, I do think that the we that Western history is very much alive and, and well and necessary, but I think that the, uh, the issue of the absence, I want to say the absence of controversy because it's still very controversial if you're doing public talks and, and so forth. A lot of the, the teachings and insights and questions of the new Western history are still uh, still provoke a lot of comment, um, I, I, uh, and, and in, in surprising ways, right? Um, but the larger controversy over it, the, the kind of coverage in the New York Times and the Washington Post was, I think, necessarily brief and, and can't go on. And what does that say, you know, whether or not fields should be trying, people in fields who want attention for those fields should be trying to create that kind of attention is, is another, another question. Right. Uh, a lot of observers uh, said at the time said that it was it was, you know, brilliant, a masterstroke of new Western historians to pull that off, um, 
to get all that attention. I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I, I will leave it open as to whether fields, people should be trying to do that. I don't think that the absence of controversy is the reason for the absence of jobs in new Western history. I, it, it's the absence of jobs period in all fields that I think is the real issue there. I think I'd like to pick up on uh, roughly where Louis left off. Um, and for me, the, one of the big takeaways, um, you know, in thinking back to the past is, um, you know, that history and the work we do as historians, it matters uh, because of the connection between national identity and the narratives that we tell of the past. And Western history is still a key part of this. Uh, so I think that our work uh, really helps us critically interrogate what we think we know about the past mm -hmm. and the continued centrality of the North American West to the United States. Um, so, you know, of course, uh, Patty gave us homework to do uh, for this, uh, for this uh, session and uh, asked us to read this article, evaluating that 1990s, there you go, kerfuffle over the new Western history. And what, you know, one of the other things that really struck me was, you know, the fact that many of these, you know, criticisms from the 90s that were raised in response to new Western history sound so much like the ones recently heard in response to removal of Confederate monuments or the reappraisals of the founding fathers and other vaunted white figures from our nation's past. And some people still complain about any type of critical interrogation of the past that does not simply celebrate the United States and westward expansion at the hands of noble white pioneers. So, you know, in, in the evaluations of nearly every class I teach on American Indian history or the North American West, I get one or two critical comments like these. You know, I mean, it's, it's like they read this stuff from the 90s and just copied and pasted it in. I actually don't think they did. Instead, it, you know, I see those comments as an affirmation that I'm doing something right. Um, so we have to think critically then about the narratives of the past that we craft. It's a key step in reckoning with the twin sins of the origin of the United States, chattel slavery of blacks and theft of indigenous homelands. And when we continue to frame Western history around the reality of the expansion of slavery across stolen native lands, we provide a critical correction to the continued myths of the West that are embedded within white supremacy. And only by coming to terms with these origins can we move forward with realizing the more laudatory promises of America. And so this you know, tendency to whitewash the past, especially in Western history, kind of back to touching on that point that uh, of paradox that Anne raised, it's, you know, not uncommon to, or, or it's, it's still very strong today, this, this idea of whitewashing the past. It's not uncommon to hear my students ask why they had to wait until college to hear these narratives. Um, you know, or it saddens me when I hear Native students relate how my classes are the first time that they've had any American history in the curriculum beyond, you know, Cherokee removal and Thanksgiving. Um, you know, and they also then remark that this is the first time they've ever had a Native person in the front of the classroom. Um, and then I'll go ahead and be the one to pluck the low hanging fruit here. We can point to the remarks of Rick Santorum earlier this week. We birthed a nation from nothing. I mean, there was nothing there. This myth of an empty continent pervades the old Western history to which the new Western history was responding. Um, I promise I'll be a little more upbeat in uh, some of my other answers. Yeah, I think, you know, I just want to respond to, to both Josh and, and to Anne. I think, I mean, I think one of the big lessons learned or one of the big takeaways from, from the new Western history was actually who gets to tell that history, right? I think, you know, Louis and I came up, you know, through grad school just at the moment when, you know, new Western history is coming on to the, you know, into the profession. And all of a sudden there was a whole bunch of different voices telling those stories. And I think inevitably when you have those different voices telling different stories from different perspectives, um, that history becomes painful um, and very difficult. And I think, you know, that's where a lot of the vitriol came out of. I think it's, you know, it's clearly what you've seen in the last um, year over the taking down of the Confederate monuments also as well. And so I, I do like that comparison of thinking, you know, what we all went through with the new Western history and thinking about Custer or the cutting up of Oñate's foot um, in New Mexico. Um, those are things that Western historians were th we've been thinking about for the last um, 20, 25 years.
but I think it's not just so much who now gets to tell this story and tell this narrative, but also the perspective, right? And I think, you know, one of the really big holes that the Western history, you know, began to push onto the American narrative was that we could no longer be content to tell the story from eastward movement, you know, we're moving out into the West, into what, you know, Santorum thinks was this, you know, empty, you know, empty place. Um, instead that there were a lot of us, a lot of people who were already here, who had their own narratives, who had their own stories. And so I think just the, you know, the mere nature of making people reflect on different perspectives, the different kind of movements of history, um, that was really important to the field. And I think that's something that's been a long legacy that has impacted um, not only U.S. history, but I also think global histories of how we tell, of how we tell these stories. So, uh, Lynn, I have just two interesting little factoids that I'll be very brief on, but I always wonder about them. Uh, one of them is that I seem to be female, and that I think had a lot to do with the vitriol, at least in the profession. And I wonder sometimes if Patrick Nelson Limerick had written Legacy, I don't know, sometimes I think that the older guys would have taken down a young male much more earnestly and effectively on that. So there's that, that I just think, how, how much was that how skewed by my... I will say one person who, well, I won't say who, came up to me once at a conference, an older man who'd been quite nice. And he said, Patty, what we have really liked about you is that you haven't been a woman. And I went, I'm not quite following. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think he meant you haven't been a strident feminist. I think that's what he meant as I struggled to decode that. So, but I do think that my being uh, Patricia Nelson Limerick, I think that really, and uh, heaven's sake, there are hundreds of others working in this cause, but I was kind of the, uh, I don't know what the lightning rod for a while there. So the second thing about Louis' point about, do we want a lot of press attention? Is that something that would get more jobs? If it will get more jobs for young people, I'm in there, I'll do it. Um, and yet I'm not entirely sure that it goes very far, that it lasts very long on that. And I wanna say that the key thing was that I had worked myself silly on that trails towards the new Western history exhibit with the five, uh, well, the four corner states in Wyoming, I, humanities councils, I'd worked so hard on that. and I. It I, I put so much time to, into it, it had to get attention. So I called the Denver Bureau guy for the Washington Post and he came to the trails conference. He said to me, I am so glad you called me because the New York Times always gets these kinds of stories before us. So, mm -hmm. so that's where that all started. Um, and then in fact, right after the Washington Post ran a story of Patricia Limerick and looking very female, I'm sure, and, and Frederick Jackson Turner, I guess looking quite male, the two of us there, then I don't know, two days later, Richard Bernstein from the New York Times called me with mm -hmm. a sort of, oh, we should have had that story. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the advice, call the Washington Post, get them to do it. That will make the New York Times jealous and, and <laughs> so very useful information there. Yeah, but yeah, Louis, you look like you're. Eddie, yeah. can I ask you a question? Yeah, you, you had been, had you been a Nielsen fellow at Harvard or something? I mean, you had connections to journalism. Yeah. And one of the things I've always admired about your prose is how easily uh, people can quote it very easily in the newspaper. Like the the way that you write lends itself to that kind of quotation, so that you seem like you had connections to these people that you were able to use to do some of this? So uh, uh, everyone's terror that this session will turn into me just reminiscing wildly is, uh, it's not gonna happen. I'm, I'll, but I will answer that question because it is important. I'll uh, start early. I was in Banning, California, which you may have heard of because that's what well, you all heard about that. Riverside Press and Enterprise uh, County newspaper had an office there. I had an after school job. It got me out of um, sixth period, seventh period chemistry. So I had a job at the Riverside Press Enterprise and I wrote obituaries there. And I did get to just, Riverside Press Enterprise was, it got Pulitzer's, it was doing really well. So I got to <laughs> have my little after school job there. Then when I went to Harvard as an assistant professor, the Neiman program uh, was, had to have a uh, selection committee every year. And there were so few women on the faculty at Harvard. So even though I was a brand new assistant professor, I was recruited to be on that committee. Yeah. Uh, not. Be I don't think anyone knew of my distinguished career writing obituaries in, in California, but I got to be on that Neiman committee. Then I got to be on the Neiman advisory committee. So for four years, I was hanging out with a lot of those folks, whatever it is, maybe the banning thing was more important. I just thought, well, if you want something for a reporter, you must call them. And I wanted someone to cover that trails conference because I worked really hard. So, but I think you're absolutely right that I had gotten that. Uh, <laughs> they are looking for stories all the time. So 
if you think you have one, tell that. To the and you want, and you want to jump in? Well, I was just thinking of a of a present comparison um, that maybe helps tie some of this stuff up. So. The amazing thing is that the press cared about this, that there was some academic fight going on and the press cared about this. So we're having a very similar kind of argument about who has authority to tell native history. And right. there was a you know, big fight in the AHR about you know, a book review. And so there's a similar tussle over authority and who's whose job it is to tell those stories, who has access to different kinds of sources. And it is about you know, perspectives and the way you tell stories. But that particular fight doesn't seem to be getting attention in the New York Times. So is that a moment? Because oh, you know, an academic fight is you know, not that interesting usually to other people, even though it matters in the field. I mean, my own personal impression, which is changing a little bit, but the New York Times didn't know there were Indians for quite a long time. So the chances of their paying attention to, to different ways of interpreting Indian history, that was really weird. And, and now I think better, I think it's, it's going better. Uh, but, and maybe the, maybe the tragedies of COVID on reservations would be one reason for that, but, but it was not the place where you would look to see what was happening in Indian country. And, uh, and I would say, for instance, that I can't believe that they haven't noticed that that Mark Trant revived Indian country today. And there's a whole spectacular source of, I mean, that is one dynamic human being. Has he ever been, this, I'm violating someone's confidence with this, but Mark and I tried and tried and tried to get a piece into the New York Times about the stupid, stupid, stupid use of the word tribalism. We are like hundreds and thousands, I'm very tired of when you're going to say white people are having quite a fight. You say, oh, they have gone tribal. Oh. <laughs> so, so we wrote, uh, Mark and I co-authored a piece, which we still haven't, we're not giving up, but we still haven't gotten that, that in there. I would say uh, the New York Times columnists are particular enthusiasts for, for the word tribal and tribalism as a pejorative. Now they're being pissants together. And, and Mark is so positioned he knows so many stories about where that is just complete as I do too but but he was had so much authority to say quit that find another word but I don't know we're still we're going to break through there at some point David Brooks is going to notice oh David Brooks is going <laughs> even Paul Krugman will notice that'll be astounding that'll show that we're in a, a new era entirely sorry I have feelings about those guys so now I'm through I'm um, I'm wondering now if I could ask our panelists to ponder um, the homework that we have that Josh referred to, which is Natalie Massett's recent article, we have a visual aid here, right, in the uh, WHQ called When Western History Tried to Reinvent Itself, Revisionism Controversy and the Reception of the New Western History. And in it, she provides a rather gloomy picture of the present state of Western history. So I thought we'd like to hear our panelists thought on that. And Josh, you could get us started. Sure. sure. Um, you know, I should probably preface my comments here by noting that the new Western history is really the only Western history um, that I have known. My first exposure to Western history uh, in an academic setting came when new Western history was already kind of an established uh, shift in the field. And by the time I went back to graduate school for my doctorate, uh, new Western history texts were already kind of the classics, um, you know, that, that you turn to. Um, you know, and only if, you know, you were really digging deeply into Western historiography did you go, um, you know, further back into that. So this background uh, has shaped my own experience at even conceiving of what Western history is supposed to be. Um, so in kind of ass assessing your question here, Lynn, I disagree with Massup's prognosis. I would argue that um, you know, I'm pretty well positioned to assess the state of Western history because I recently co-chaired the WHA conference uh, committee. And that 2019 conference uh, reflected the exceptional diversity of the field, what the critics in the 90s were whining about as the fragmentation of Western history. Yeah, and so for example, you know, the 2019 conference there in Vegas, we had sessions that reevaluated the rest as a, the West as a region, specifically with its connections to other regions, such as the South and the Pacific, which is something I care deeply about. Uh, there were sessions highlighting the diverse colonial engagements with the North American West, that it uh, is more than just a story of the West as a stage for 
US expansion. We had sessions that brought Western history into the 21st century, engaging with the continued relevance of the West in politics and popular culture today. Sessions on the varied environmental histories of the North American West from public lands to dams to marine spaces to indigenous homelands. And of course, many, many sessions of the diverse historical actors and communities that shaped the North American West and continue to do so today. Uh, kind of touching upon a, the point that Maria brought up. So the breadth of sessions at the 2019 conference there in Vegas, they were an excellent reflection of the state of the field. And you know they were captured by that year's theme, what happens in the West doesn't stay in the West. Uh, kind of back to Anne's leaky bucket. And I'll let you all in on a little secret here. And I think, I think Louie knows this, but the rest of you probably don't. The number, breadth, and diversity of the sessions did not come from my co-chair and me working hard at creating sessions and twisting arms. Nearly all those sessions were ones that came to us that were proposed by the members. So when I assess the health of, say, a field, and I look at something like that 2019 conference, it sure looks really healthy to me. You know, and so you know, this morning as I came into work, you know, I, you know, thought crossed my mind. And I was like, I wonder when Massup was ever at a Western history, uh, WHA. Um, you know, I happened to have, um, you know, a, a folder with, you know, all the programs from like the last 10 plus years and their PDFs of those. So it's really easy to search it. She doesn't show up on any of them. Um, you know, doesn't mean she wasn't there, but she certainly wasn't there as a presenter, a chair, or a commentator engaged with what I see as a healthy, robust um, Western history. That's really interesting. Can I, can I follow up on that? So, you know, just follow up on, on Josh, you know, so, you know, this year I'm the current president of the Western History Association. And I have to say, you know, it's even with COVID, doing the conference online, I think if anything, that has made the organization even stronger. Um, it was able to sort of pivot um, to an online and sort of bring in more people also as well. And I think, you know, um, you know, following up on the 2019 conference, I think what we saw this year also was, an, again, an incredible array of panels that were proposed by our members in which the committee did not have to do very much work to sort of fill, fill it in. And what I've sort of noticed over the last, I'd say, 10 years of the WHA is how diverse it is, right? I think the numbers, the kinds of panels that are there, and I think what you're seeing in the WHA um, is that it's become a home for a lot of different groups of people, um, particularly Native scholars, Indigenous scholars, Latin, Latino, Latina uh, scholars. Um, it's still a great place for doing gender work as well. And so I think, you know, what you've seen, um, you know, I think the very sort of breadth of new Western history and the way it embraced all different kinds of scholars is just been a, an exceptional legacy for, for this organization. So I also disagree with, with her sort of analysis of the, um, the, the so-called, you know, death of the field or the dying of the field. I think it's more robust than as it has been for the last 20, 25 years. I'll, I'll weigh in too. The, the Las Vegas conference, which was uh, until Right until right now, it's it's the most well, it's the most recent one we've had. It that was we're actually physically at a conference, um, and I believe that was the biggest conference yeah. ever yeah. for the WHA. I don't know how twenty twenty stacked up. Probably bigger still because it was also it was online, so people could come even e more easily. Um, but that's that's pretty extraordinary to have the biggest conference in the field at the end of what is 40 years of austerity in public higher education funding. Um, there, if there is a decline in the membership, in the paid memberships, and I don't know the numbers on that, somebody else would have to fill me in. But if there is, what I would say is I, I think that all academic organizations, professional organizations have shrunk somewhat or, or are shrinking. I mean, the problem is that there are very there are relatively uh, many fewer professorships for people to fill. And over the long term, prospectively fewer members if we don't have professors to join. Now we have, we have other members as well. We have public historians, uh, we have high school teachers, we have lay members, we have all kinds of members in the WHA, 
but I that's a kind of critical component uh, that would account for if there is a decline in membership that I think that would be why I, I don't think I mean you'd have to compare the WHA to other organizations to come up with any kind of com I think more compelling argument that something's wrong at the WHA um, and, and it's shrinking because it's that it's something that's wrong with the WHA no something's wrong with the state of the financing of higher education as we all know this is deeply wrong and that also has Western roots, right? The story of Western public higher education is deeply committed to uh, to the to the histories of conquest and the making of the region, right? The making of public universities. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, to to underscore both what Maria and, and Josh have said that um, when you go to the WHA these days, compared to what it was even 15 years ago, right? Um, when it was still, I mean. 15 years ago, I could go to the WHA and there were panels on the borderlands of the US-Mexico border in Spanish with a full slate of scholars from Mexico, from Mexican universities presenting, right? In addition to all these people presenting from, from the US, it was already that going, that kind of thing. And there's always, and Dave Edmonds gave a talk probably 10 years ago where he totaled up the number of panels in Native American history and showed that prior to the, to the founding, at least, of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, prior to the founding of that organization, no organization had had anywhere near as many panels on Native history as the WHA had had. So there are these long traditions in Western history of these fields coming along, but today, it, you walk into WHA and, and it's, it's in all the good ways, head spinning all the stuff that's going on in borderlands, indigenous and Native American environmental history um, and, and the history of popular culture as well. There's, there's just a lot going on and it's extraordinarily diverse and very youthy, uh, lots and lots of grad students. Um, and and it's, it's, not, it's a really, I feel really good about the WHA these days. I, I didn't know, I was kind of surprised that the article ended there. Right. So, um, boy, I, I was the one who staked my reputation by saying in the late 1980s, there is going to be a renaissance in Western American history. When I said that, I had no idea if there was going to be a renaissance in Western American history. So that's where I guess, uh, personally, I am the most exhilarated because I am the one who who's, would have been seen as a very incredibly um, inaccurate person if that hadn't happened. So I am the first to say that. And uh, some listeners will note, possibly some of them on the screen now, that once once this excellent thing started happening, first my honor was redeemed. That was very nice. And I didn't quite know what to make of it. So I had developed some loyalties to some of the old timers. I don't know why I did that, but I did. So I was not doing a great job of recognizing what I now fully recognize, that some ridiculous old customs had to go away. I held to I'm not going to say the word toast. I did not say the word toast, but uh, anyway, I did hold to some notions that were not uh, very helpful. And just kidding myself. I didn't freeze, did I? Have I frozen? No. no. You're good. I made a graceless transition, I think, at, at part of that, even though I was the one who had been so I mean, earnestly declaring this. But there were moments where I thought, well, now this is uh, getting a little bit uncomfortable here. We're having these these young people who have rather different ideas about how we should conduct ourselves as scholars. Well, thank the Lord, thank heavens. And I feel so fortunate that I was treated so, um, oh, I don't know what, unwelcomingly from some of the, not very many, but a few of the old timers. So I knew that I had to fight. I knew I could not become a tedious old bird who was, <laughs> who had planted a, a stake and was going to stand by it. And I want to say that the Thing everybody is saying in 1990 I was program committee chair and the submissions from the membership had nothing on African American history nothing on Asian American history pretty sparse on Indian history and so I won't I won't go to naming names here but I really went to town to try to invite people to come uh, quite a number of whom came but who said this really this isn't a place I I'm not my well some of those became president so, but that was, uh, that was a sad, I still remember a sad day on the floor of my office. So you stacking the, the uh, program submission still in paper and thinking, 
help. I mean, there's, there's so many missing parts here and what am I to do? So it's when you guys have been saying that just happened, the submissions, that just happened. We didn't have to go out and, and plead and beg. I thought, well, I had to plead and beg. Um, and, and then it just seemed to be, so I, I, right. I think it's really interesting that she has not been, that our interesting author, she's a very interesting author, but that she has not had the chance to think, look at all of these folks and how extraordinary that this happened. And I mean, for me, that's the most amazing thing to have been so glum about the I mean, Westward Expansion, the textbook, the chapter on Indians called The Indian Barrier, the chapter on the Spanish called The Spanish Barrier. <laughs> that was <laughs> the world I came into. And so I don't know, it seems there's not a lot of places these days to really get full out delivery systems for optimism and cheer and a sense of Man, things got better, but this everything everybody said here just confirms this is where I would I want my attention to go. Of, whoo, look at this. I mean, I, I guess to some extent, I wondered her article what she really means by Western history, right? And I think you know, for us, Western history has become so capacious, right? We we include Indigenous history, we include regional history, environmental history, and I and I wonder to some extent if she has sort of a narrow, you know, I don't quite, I'm never quite sure what she's talking about when she's talking about Western, um, Western history. Right. Uh, to, 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 to be fair, she, she is a historian of, who lives in Nice, France, so has less opportunity to come to the WHA. Um, but she, what she's really writing is a history of that moment yeah. more than anything else. And then thinking through, you know, why that unfolded in the way that it did. Um, and I don't know whether this is optimistic, but one of the things, just as editor, there's almost nothing on the 19th century anymore. So there's, there's very little scholarship sent in about the 19th century. Um, and when there is, it's hard to find reviewers. I, I got a few you know, great articles. So people are like redoing the Oregon Trail with all kinds of very interesting. Let's look at, at it from all different kinds of perspectives. But it's hard to find reviewers for that because um, you know older scholars aren't doing that reviewing work anymore. So it, it's, a, it's a funny shift as um, the guard changes. So I, I, and again, I think that's healthy. I, I would say though, Anne, that when she does say, you know, in the article that, that yeah, she's doing a history of that moment, but then where she ends, where she takes us to is, you know, does Western history really matter anymore? You know, she actually says, should we just be doing plain old good history in the West rather than Western history? And, you know, she's quoting other scholars who make the, the same argument. Um, it, and, it, and Yeah, Western history is part of an imperial moment. And if yeah. that imperial moment is over, we maybe we shouldn't be doing it anymore. Yeah, uh, and I I have such problems with that particular uh, that particular line. I, I do see a lot of people announcing that they're doing Western history by saying I'm doing a history of uh, something happening in the Southwest or. Uh, on the Pacific coast or somewhere, and that's where I am. So that's that's my Western history, but I'm not gonna actually read the Western history literature. I'm gonna connect it to literature in other places, uh, other literatures, right, of American. We can just do it as American history and not talk about the West per se as a region. And I find that really problematic uh, as an approach. I, I don't think that if I, if you're doing the history of, uh, of Atlanta or, or Miami, uh, and you don't embed it in the South in some way, I, I, I would find that a little bit problematic. I mean, I thought Nathan Connolly's work, recent work on world more concrete, right, on the, on the history of real estate in Miami was a great uh, example of a way to do 20th century history that both is connected to both sort of national history and regional history of the South. I, I just thought that was superb. And I just think that the Western history uh, it, it's, it's, we need the same kind of, I, I think to understand the West, you need the same kind of attention to region. Uh, and in fact, if you'll indulge me on that point, I have, I have some slides that I'd like to, to share. And it's just this one, uh, just this very short, here we go. Um, 
th this map, which is a really well-known map, right? Federal land is a percentage of total land area. And um, I mean, there is an argument that Massett makes at the end of her article that, you know, she, she cites this argument that, that others have made that in the political history of the, of the West, it's really no different from the, from the East uh, and from the, from the rest of the country. And in the 20th century, particularly, we could stop talking about the West as having a distinctive history. And I, I look at this map and I, land ownership means anything about political economy, that has to be wrong, right? That argument has to be wrong. And I mean, you all know, you've all done this exercise with your classes, right? This, uh, here's a slide of the map of Mahoning County, uh, Ohio, uh, which is just a typical, right? We all, we can show maps where, in which all the land is privately held. Uh, and if you look at a map of the, of the United States today, and I'm gonna, if I just expand that, um, well, you can, I mean, it, this is all the public lands over here and Indian reservations as well, and military reservations. And then the East looks like this. And in fact, if you know anything about how all these little green parts, uh, which are US Forest Service, and all of these other colored parts over here came into being, it's after these were created, they were created back over here in the East, that a lot of environmental law begins in the West. And in addition to this, I mean, the, the presence, continuing presence of these very large native nations with large land holdings, uh, right, is, is such a factor in the West. But I guess it's, it's this map that is, a, is just a great example of, um, this is from the 1960 study uh, by Wesley Califf, private, private grazing and public lands. That's a map of one ranch. Right, and that map is in, this is, uh, I'm trying to remember where, I think it's in Wyoming. Um, and it, the different land holdings that are made up that the ranch is comprised of. And you can see that the land that the rancher actually owns is just this little bit here. And all of this other, the other lands are leased private land, leased or subleased state land, Taylor grazing land, which is BLM land. And then section 15 lease land, which is another category of BLM land, and then other people's land. And all of this is one ranch, right? And the, the number of different ownership regimes that the owner has to, has to manage um, and, and to sort of negotiate, I think makes that different from owning a farm in Pennsylvania, I think, or a ranch in Texas. I, 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 that's, that's my take on it. And I do think that that has something to do with this moment, which is the 1995 standoff at Bundy Ranch, which many people now are saying, right, was a dress rehearsal for January 6th. Um, whether you want to agree with that or not, I, I don't know. But I'll stop sharing and I'll, I'll be quiet now. But just that I don't, I think if, if your political history that you're doing of the 20th century West isn't explaining, uh, isn't touching on any of those things, maybe you're not asking the right questions, right? If, if, if it's not coming up, if you're looking at the 20th century West and it looks just like everywhere else, I think, I think maybe you might be asking the wrong questions. I'll stop there. Great, thanks for that. Um, maybe we'll have now a fairly quick, maybe a lightning round, we'll call it, because we wanna leave time for questions. Um, since we sort of look like Hollywood squares, think of it as a game show. Um, there, there, I dated myself. How about um, telling us about what you're most excited about as you look at the field today, or you think about the future, or concerned about, or just plain baffled by, or some thoughts on that? Patty, you want to get us started? Yeah, uh, I'm exhilarated, but I, I just can't keep from doing this here. So, so, good Lord, look at all this stuff. I just, I didn't, I didn't, I just, be, I mean, it goes on and on here. Okay, for heaven's sake, books that I just thought. I never thought about asking that. What a thing. So uh, Thomas Richards, Breakaway Americas, the unmanifest future of the Jacksonian United States, uh, soon to be followed by Drew Eisenberg's wonderful book. All of the times, I mean, millions of students who have been told about manifest destiny as a, as a widespread American belief. And then Thomas Richards and, and Drew Eisenberg saying, are you sure? Did they really use that term that much? Weren't they more interested in getting land under whatever sovereignty they could get? So, whoo, boy, never thought about that. Uh, oh, boy, Alice Bond got their uh, south towards south to freedom and the um, the Underground Railroad going from Mexico, or excuse me, from Texas to Mexico with with African American slaves, thinking 
hey, Mexico did emancipation before we did some, and then that all shapes the Civil War. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm not going on forever. I'm just gonna only as much as I can hold. It's all okay. Uh, Cameron Blevins, Paper Trails, the U.S. Post in the Making of the American West. Totally fresh view on the federal government because the post office was such a different agency and crucial, obviously, to the Indian Wars. Uh, attacks on Indian people coordinated through the, through the mail, but all sorts of ways in which you can track Western settlement. Where are they growing? Where are they uh, contracting? Oof. Now, I'm not going to go on forever. Okay. Uh, oh, we were talking about having greater time span in the 19th century, Erica Perez's colonial intimacies, inter-ethnic kinship, sexuality, and marriage in Southern California. Woo, 1769 to 1895. All these people are asking questions I never, never occurred to me to ask. And, oh goodness, okay. All right, I'll stop soon here. Uh, uh, and actually, I'm gonna, uh, Katrina Jagodinsky's book, Legal Codes and Talking Trees, Indigenous Women's Sovereignty in the, in the Sonoran and Puget Sound Borderlands. 1854 to 1946, 19th century stuff, but just her recognition that court records had testimony from Indian women who were never going to be writing autobiographies or letters to friends and so on. I think it might have been, well, they're, I can't even, I'm getting exhilarated again. So it's just astounding. And But it was Katrina, in some ways, it's kind of the moment where I thought, who would have thought to think of those legal, those court cases as a source for stories way beyond the implications of the court cases? Uh, Maurice Crandall. The, these people have always been a republic, indigenous electorates in the US-Mexico borderlands, 1598 to 1912. I am so fortunate. I read this book about the importance of voting to Indian people in November of 2020, when I needed to think about something about voting that was not what we were all thinking. And then all of these interesting uh, things that, uh, Brendan Rensick, native but foreign indigenous immigrants and refugees in the North American borderland, several studies, Eric Meek as well, on the people who were living somewhere and then had an international border come, come through them. So I'm, I'm quitting, I'm quitting, but uh, what am I excited about? What I'm, what I'm excited about is that the Mellon Foundation gave the Southern American West support so that I can work with all these young folks, if they choose that, to reach wider audiences. So what, what kind of worried me 20 years ago was we seem to be going 24 seven academic at the Western History Association. And I didn't, that was not my goal. But now it seems like the younger scholars are so interested and many middle-aged and older ones in reaching wider audiences. So the applied history thing with Mellon Foundation, we get to have what we call academic skills repurposing workshops to take the things that came from graduate training and, and then just conjure up the audiences that need to hear what these folks are working on. So I'm excited. Great. Who wants to jump in? Anne? I'll jump in. Um, I One thing I'm, I'm, I don't know, excited about is not maybe the right word here, but maybe a little worried about. Um, I feel like we haven't fully come to terms with how gender matters in this picture. So if, if you if you take the long haul of the history of North America, you know, the the fact that you know the captivity of women is at the heart of so many colonial economies, and you know up until the present, where we tolerate you know huge numbers of missing young Native women as you know part of what happens on reservations and in cities. So there's there's there, there's something at the heart of Western history that involves gender that I don't think we've fully teased out yet, and people again people make lip service about talking about gender, and I'm probably guilty of this too, um, but we don't really dig in there to ask some of those harder questions about that. Yeah, Maria, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, you Anne. I think there's people out there who are, are doing some really fabulous work, and I'm not sure how it's not, it's, you know, I was just, I was just on a book manuscript workshop a, a couple of weeks ago and, and had to have like the, the gender conversation I thought we were done having um, 20, um, 20 years ago. So um, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I would say, you know, all this great work, I think one place where Western history is not really addressed it and one place where I think where we could really do some reaching out um, is to scholars who do Asian American history. And I think thinking about the Asian American experience within the context of Western history is really important. And so I think 
us being more open to those scholars and bringing them more in fully into um, into the work that all of us are doing would be beneficial for, for us particularly. And I think help them out also as well. But I just see that's still one place where, where we haven't quite made the, the inroads that we have with indigenous scholars and Latinx um, scholars. Yeah. Louis, Josh, thoughts? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and dive in. Um, yeah, so, you know, from my perspective, one of the things I'm really excited about is, uh, you know, how, you know, some of the developments that have come since, uh, you know, new Western history, um, you know, kind of hit the scene, um, specifically the focus on indigenous agency and the resilience of native nations. It's not just, you know, native peoples were there and they were victimized, um, but there's a much more complex and complicated narrative uh, to tell that also helps to connect um, a lot of issues today uh, that are relevant across uh, Indian country. Um, you know, and many of these things have been spoken to by Maria about the perspectives and who gets the right to tell certain stories. I'm really happy that Patty brought up the amazing work that Mark Trahant is doing. Um, boy, I'd really like him to somehow be a lot more involved in the WHA in some way. I think that could be a, a priceless connection. Um, and then the, the other piece that really excites me are the ways that, you know, kind of back to Anne's leaky bucket, um, the way that uh, the West is you know, getting wet and looking into the Pacific and moving just beyond a simple terrestrial framework. Um, so I think I'll leave it uh, there for uh, the spirit of Lynn's lightning round. So Louis. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, all of this is, is, is great. I was making notes of Patty's list of books and, and I agree wholeheartedly with Anne and, and Maria that we haven't uh, we haven't been discussing gender much in this session, and there's a there is a lot of work that that still needs to be done uh, on gender and and its relation to to Western what things and Western subjects and and everywhere else as well, of course. But um, things that excite me in terms of Western history, I uh, and where we where we're headed, I, I just it's every day practically there's a new title in Indigenous history that kind of blow. I just look at it and think, oh my God, I never thought. I never even thought about that, and and now I've got another book I have to read. There's just an explosion of uh, th from this new generation of of indigenous scholars that I think is really exciting. Um, uh, I have a graduate student, Dimitri Brown, is working on uh, the Santa, Santa Clara Pueblo and and the creation of the Manhattan Project and Los, basically the the native Los Alamos. Um, which is a uh, you know something that I had never thought of, and that kind of of merging of older fields uh, and and fields that seemed unrelated, nuclear history and native history, which of course when I think about it, they're profoundly related. I mean, all of those people in the Pacific who suffer from and and on the and on the on the continent as well who suffer from right nuclear explosions and nuclear testing right that. Uh, and, and the Pacific has been uh, something I've, I've been watching, hoping to see a lot more of in our histories for a long time, like Josh says. And I'm really excited about the way Western history is sort of engaging with that. Um, and and I, just, I just find it, uh, it, it's really great. And I just find this is a really exciting time to be a Western historian and to be interested in these things. There's a lot to read. There are a lot of good people to talk to, uh, and there's just a lot of really great conversations to have. So I'm I'm very optimistic uh, about the field, and really excited about it. Great. I might just throw in my two cents that I'm also so excited about the the impact that our scholars are that study African Americans in the West are having on conversations about white supremacy in this country, and I think that the prize-winning Houston Bound book, the work about LA by Marnie Campbell. There's so many examples of excellent scholarship um, by up and coming scholars of African-American history. And I think it's so important for them to be a part of these conversations and not just scholars of the South. And I think we have a lot to learn from them and that that could be really transformative for us in Western history, but for the national conversation. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we should turn to our Q&A, if you all are ready. I, there's a, a growing list of questions here and I might just, I'll throw out some of, uh, some of them and I probably won't get to all of them, but let's see how we do. Um, there's a question here about um, the public history controversy today 
um, that Adam is asking um, seems fueled by defenses and critiques of the 1619 projects and various counter reports. Do you see continuities or disconnects between how new Western history reached the public and changed the professoriate? Um, what do you think about that? Thoughts on that one? Yeah, that's something I can um, address or speak to partially. Um, yes, I, I, I think that there is a lot to work to be done and there's a lot of work that we are doing in the public history realm. Um, you know, I think of a lot of the robust, um, you know, like public history centers uh, that we have, like the one down at University of Utah that Greg Smoke uh, operates. Um, and for me, what I see is that uh, we are doing some good work at reach at outreach, especially to or in, in some cases to tribal nations, um, to in some cases with curricular development, uh, curriculum development, uh, particularly around the inclusion of American Indian history, say in K through 12 type uh, settings. And that's just scratching the surface, though. Um, that is where we really need to be doing um, a substantial amount of more work. Um, I am seeing a bit more of it being done with some of the museums, uh, with some of the museum exhibits, um, you know, that have, you know, kind of more inclusion of these types of narratives and perspectives and angles and histories. Um, but I think that that's something that we need to um, do much more of. And it gets back to that point of, you know, students coming into our classrooms saying, why have I never heard this before? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got these piles of great books that, you know, Patty and all of us could probably pull off our shelves and off our floors and wherever and say, look at this wealth of material. Um, and it still isn't percolating quite down to the K through 12 in ways that it should. Um, so I think we've got some inroads that uh, we've already made, but we have a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to speak to that question? Uh, I feel that the 1619 fight got sterile and predictable really fast. And I don't really thrive in sterile and predictable. So I have kind of, uh, and, and for, I mean, it just seems like it, everyone got their script and began performing their script. And I know which scripts I prefer to others, but it, it didn't seem like it was an opportunity. I mean, I'm always scoping out the, where could I get my foot in there for some contribution on a controversial thing? But I just thought this one was, I, I, what I usually say is what I hate the most is when people, I'll say, oh, a, a cocktail party, oh, a historian, oh, we had a football coach who made us memorize dates and <laughs> I how to stay awake. And I think, oh, now this is the worst. So I usually think fighting is better because people are awake. But something about 1619 fighting seemed to be kind of yawn producing. I shouldn't say that, I suppose, because there's so much at stake at it, but something just, maybe it's because of that great gray lady of the New York Times again. I seem to be developing quite a, a vendetta against the New York Times here, but it, it just, it didn't make me think we should go there. Then the 1776 thing was, was just like, oh really, what year is it now? And why do I seem to be so old if this is the same old nonsense from before and so on? So I don't think I would I would go there. But I just I just think that my sense is that that might be where the West could be refreshing. That there's if that if somebody if this team wants to get together and have a little exchange on how could we get into the sixteen nineteen discussions uh, in a way that would really make the points that everyone's been making about why it's still valuable to study the West and, and refresh that conversation that I think went stale way too fast. And I don't know if I'm going to mean this tomorrow morning. I think tomorrow morning I might think, did you say that? But I'm saying that now. Okay. Um, Anne, yeah. Well, just, I do think there is some value in talking about the forms of slavery that unfold in the West and what it looks like over time. And that could refresh that conversation. So who's making slaves out of who, how that shifts over time. And I think one of the, the issues with the 1619, it's, it's really important, but that's one distinctive kind of slavery. And whether it's good or bad about the US or the West, but we have a lot of different kinds of slavery. So you know, thinking through that is worth it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Louis. I think that, I mean, public history is, is always a battleground. I, I've never seen a public history subject that doesn't become uh, some kind of grounds for a fight about how it's being interpreted or how it should be interpreted. Um, and, and I think that's healthy. I, I think that you have to be re reappraising and reappraising the, the history as it plays out of the public eye and the stories we tell each other publicly about the history. Um, I guess, you know, when I, when I think about slavery in the West, obviously Andres Resendez's work was really exciting and there's a lot of other good work too on forced labor and unfree labor and going all the way back at least to Howard Lamar, right, um, on, that, on that subject. And there's, there's just a lot you could do. What, what I would say though about the controversies around these things is um, there, the, the controversy that I've run into in doing public history events on the work that I do. It depends very much on my audience, right? Uh, but writing a book in which I said that Buffalo Bill Cody really did not ride for the Pony Express seems to have been the most controversial thing I ever wrote. Uh, apparently, this is the thing that, that has set off more people than anything else in that book, which the book's a, not a small book, and there's a lot of stuff in it that is is the one argument that more people have wanted to have with me than any other and i try to get at why they're so invested in that story which is um, a very short story in the in the life of william cody and and clearly fictional right um but they're really invested in that story and so trying to figure out what it means to them and what they're so terrified of because in some, some cases it, it comes flat out as how could you possibly be erasing this? Um, and and what, the, what the question they're asking is what am I supposed to replace it with? I think that's their, that's what, what energizes a lot of the fear around changing narratives in public mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. What's the new narrative? Right. And I want to just give the big, uh, you know, the, the exhortation to us to write the new narratives so that people know what they're supposed to replace things with, right? Mm -hmm. And all of us are working on, historians are working on that. But synthesis is as important as, as monographic research in that regard. And, um, and I do think developing new syntheses of Western history and U.S. history uh, that explain how these explain these stories, put them together, and allow people to feel connected to those stories in some powerful mm -hmm. way, will help get the public history remade and mm -hmm. get past these controversies. Yeah, that kind of leads into another question we have here, and I, I have to keep going because we're getting they're coming in fast and furious. But this is actually one Maria I know you could speak to, which is how can we think about the West in transnational and global ways without discounting what distinguishes it as a region. And do you think there's a danger in our field becoming too narrowly invested in a region? How can we avoid exceptionalizing the West? So I thought you might want to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, this is, I love, oops, are you guys getting feedback? We can hear you now. I, I can. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting feedback. I don't know why. Um, I mean, I, you know, exactly. I mean, for me, you know, the theme for this year's WH, um, um, meeting is is thinking about the west in a global global context and for me the west is about a place where people are drawn to right it's a place where they make their homes but it's also a place where they don't give up thinking about the places that they that they came from and so you know i don't like to think of the west as a trans as transient place but as a real as a real home um, for a bunch of different kinds of people and people trying to figure out how to make their homes with with one another and so i think um, you know, not more so than any other region in the US, but certainly the West is a crossroads. It is a place where people come, they pass through, they make homes, they make new connections back to the places that they came from. So I think that that's a really valuable place for us to be thinking about, about Western history and those, those kinds of connections. Just, just a um, pony up on that one. Um, it, Louis slides about public lands there's a danger of saying something like the West is distinctive and exceptional because it has public lands, mm -hmm. but you can instantly make that not exceptional and comparative by talking about 
other places and other times that have struggled with those issues. So, you know, globally, how does this look in other places and other times? So international comparisons about that. How do they do it in Canada? What happens in Mexico? Um, so it's not, it, it, it doesn't argue that the West is exceptional. It's just, it's peculiar, but in a way that's common to other places. Right, and I, I guess I could say that the one unbearable problem that has come upon us is that there's too much good stuff and keeping up with it is just hopeless, uh, which gets us back. And the transnational thing certainly doesn't help when you just the darned Australians in California, that's enough trouble right there. It's just, it's very difficult to, so, so the transnational thing takes what is the pre-existing problem, which is that it's really hard to hold it together because there's so much good stuff. And that's where I really wanted to accent uh, Louis's point about synthesis and synthesis with the attitude, if I might refer to legacy of conquest as having an attitude. So, so not, uh, not a textbook, not a textbook, but a, a, an attitude. So more of that. And yet our profession is not really on board with that. The research monograph is still the currency of the realm. And thank heavens, because so many things get get produced from that, that a synthesizer can just be in heaven with. So the, the fact that I was a parasite on so many else, other people's hard work is just a huge, that's the bedrock of my success was being a happy parasite. And, and as much as I don't think I, I think I might have misspelled somebody's, well, I won't even go there, but I do remember a couple of people whose names I misspelled, but I tried to cite everybody whose work I valued and tried to make it a little bit more of a chorus than a solo on that. And I, well, I won't tell you which names I misspelled, but I apologize to those of you whose names I misspelled for, for that. But that was just me trying to say, let's bring it together, because if, if we can do that, then, then there's a chance that that some people will go to the go to the individual monographs that I was waving around here and, and want to know more about it. But I think our profession really has to take some deep breaths about do we uh, encourage younger people to aspire to do synthesis or do we know that that will be the the uh, death of their resume in any search process mm. if they have that. Mm -hmm. that. I hope I'm overstating that. Maybe I am. I hope so. But uh, I, I do remember for myself when my second book was when people would say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing an overview of Western American history. People would think, do you have any kind of counselor that you see? Do you have some therapist that can help you with that? So, so if we could change that setting, I think that would make a huge difference. Yeah, Louis, please come ready. Just the, to link the synthesis question to the question of transnational Wests and so forth. I mean, I, the more in my own work, the more I've connected the West to places outside the West itself, right? Places outside the region, right? Um, the more I do that, the more, the clearer it becomes why the West is different, right? The, the, the differences become very clear. The connections also are really necessary to establish the differences. No region exists in a vacuum. It exists only because of the network <clears throat> of economic and social connections, but also in its geographic setting and all of the things that connect it to the sort of biotic and, and weather systems of, of, the, of the world. So I think doing transnational West uh, is a great way to underscore all of these important things about how the West is different, but also how it's connected. Um, clearly when we're doing regional histories, it's the connectedness to the rest of the world that allows us to see how it can also be a window on the rest of the world. And I agree completely about, you know, looking at the public lands, the map I showed, it stopped. It's like that old, the old weather map in USA today, where it used to just stop and there was no weather in Canada, no weather in Mexico, right? And now they've gotten, you can see how it, it goes over the borders, right? It would be really interesting to see a public lands map of the Americas um, and of the world. Um, and, and what I wanna say, just about you know that 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 public lands map is the public lands remember are are as i'm always telling my students these are uh you know legacies of of failure their conquest and failure they're the places that the government tried desperately to give away and could not right and desperately tried to give them away and could not and that 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 this map is a an artifact of a failed a whole string of failed government policies and a failed national vision. Um, in terms of synthesizing all that, I, I, I find that 
all of our assistant professors and associate professors and everyone is synthesizing all the time because they're all lecturing on this material. So they're constantly having to synthesize. And I get a little annoyed when people start saying, oh, there's just so much now, you can't synthesize it, it can't be done. Um, you know, it's really the field is just splintered. It's they always invoke the Balkans and I'm always my Balkan historian friends get really irritated with that. Right. Um, and I just find that is is we, we synthesize all the time and our job is to connect things that seem on the face of it unconnected. That's how it gets interesting. Um, and and we all do that. And I and I just want to encourage the, the professors or the teachers, the instructors who are doing that in, in classes to do aspire to write some synthetic things. But Patty is right, you're up against the monograph is what gets you promoted and syntheses uh, will, will, are, are harder to, to push that way. But I, they're just absolutely essential for our outreach to the public and our sense of ourselves as a field. Mm -hmm. You know, actually we've got a historiographic question here that this ties in perfectly with. Um, the, the, the questioner asked um, sort of what are, where do we go from here, which a lot of you have already spoken to, but what emerging historiographic trends are you most excited about, which many of you already talked about, and what past historiographic dead ends deserve to be revisited and reassessed? So I thought some of you might want to answer that. What about, uh, everyone can jump in on this, settler colonialism. So I think that has reframed the field, opened up a bunch of questions, and make some of the puzzles that were exposed by the new Western history uh, more visible. So, you know, why people could ignore certain kinds of facts, sort of that's, you know, sort of the power of settler colonialism operating. But there's something so dead endish about it. So, if you follow the logic of settler colonialism, there, there just isn't any way to sort of live past it. And, and there are native scholars who talk about operating with futurism as a way to think past this particular moment. But I wonder if any of you, you know, how do you think about that? Because I think it's been a very powerful thing to think with, but it's an issue for me anyway. I, I did write an article in the Journal of the West uh, about settler colonialism. And I couldn't, I never got the, why was this a world apart from conquest and invasion and so on. And I get that there might be particularly good reasons to think of the United States uh, conquest and invasion in relationship to New Zealand and Australia and Canada. And that seems like settler colonialism was going there. So I think after uh, just thinking, what are we doing now? And I agree that, that in my opinion, it seemed like native people were getting kind of homogenized as the settled upon in some settler colonial things. And, and settlers were getting kind of homogenized too, which they sometimes did to themselves. I understand that, but it still seemed like I wasn't, uh, there was a, a decomplexifying. Now we've got the model and now I'm not going to say it turned into political science because it was way short of that kind of model thing, but it, I didn't get that. And I consider the work of some of the people who do settler colonialism studies to be preeminent. Margaret Jacobs, for heaven's sake. So, uh, so I, I would never want to say anything of some of those, Cynthia Mitchell, uh, but I still am, am needing to have some intervention and say, this is what we got that we didn't have before with settler colonialism. So happy to have that session now in front of everyone, if that's possible. Yeah, I'd like to weigh in on this, this one. Um, I also participated in that Journal of the West um, issue that Patty just, uh, just mentioned there. And settler colonialism is definitely a framework uh, that I engage with. And for me, I think it's like any other theoretical framework. If you, if, if you use it sloppily and loosely, it loses it, its utility. Um, it gets to you know, the point, uh, you know, the criticism that Patty just raised that you know, it flattens your historical actors. So you have to be really precise when you're teasing out the different peoples um, and places uh, that you're talking about. And so for me, um, one of the things that settler colonialism has really helped um, better understand are those connections 
points that Louis was uh, uh, invoking earlier, uh, the connections um, with you know, Canada, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Palestine, all kinds of other places. But I think one of the other big pieces that we gain from settler colonialism that we didn't or that we don't necessarily get if we just kind of call it um, conquest 2.0 or think of it that way is the continuation of settler colonialism, that it's not this discrete event that happened in the in the past, like conquest, you know, X conquered Y. Um, there's, you know, this, this continuation process, um, you know, that settler colonialism still weighs on and interacts with and frames indigenous lives today. Uh, but the final point that I'd like to follow up on is the one that Anne had invoked and it's another framework that I'm coming more into engaging with, and that's that of indigenous futurity, indigenous futurisms. Um, and so that's a powerful um, analytical point that is being made there because indigenous history is oftentimes framed in the safety of the past. Native peoples are static, they only belong in the past, they have no stake and no role in the world today and haven't for a long time. You know, we're frozen in the 19th century. Um, and so indigenous futurisms really blows that apart and shows that, you know, native peoples have always been future facing. We don't need to wait till the 21st century and, you know, our Twitter accounts and whatever else is out there with social media to be, you know, future facing natives. Um, we've always been future facing. And I think back to, you know, like Patty was waving around the book on the Postal Service. Well, not only was that how news and, you know, military orders were passing back and forth, but this was also how Native peoples communicated with each other. Um, you know, and this was a point that, you know, Louis makes in his own work about, you know, ways that Native peoples used things you know, technological things like the railroad and the postal service to communicate news of, say, the ghost dance. Um, you know, and so these, you know, kind of technological engagements, you know, all of these different ways that Native peoples have engaged with expanding markets, uh, the court system, back to Jay Godensky's book. I mean, all of that shows us kind of the richness of Indigenous futurity that has existed for a very long time. Maria where you had her hand and Louie, no? Okay, Louie? Um, yeah, just uh, I agree with, uh, with everything Josh has, has just said. And, and that I, I would add settler colonial theory has been around a long time. Um, I first started reading it in the late 80s in graduate school uh, because I entered graduate school as a Southern Africanist. I was gonna work on the history of Southern Africa. I'd spent a couple of years in Zimbabwe teaching school. and. Um, I, I was very intrigued with, with the history of that region. Um, I would say I'm really interested uh, in how settler colonial theory addresses, because it's transnational, right? It, because it's comparative, right? And it, it lays out these settler colonial processes. The, the, the main, one of the main teachings of settler colonial theory from Patrick Wolf, right, is about the disappearance of the native and the way that settler colonial regimes try to make natives disappear one way or another, right? It can be through genocidal means, it can be through assimilative means, it's through removing them and getting them out of sight, but just get them away. Um, and clearly that's failed in some settler colonial regimes, right? It clearly failed in South Africa in a big way. Uh, but it's clearly failed and failing and failing constantly and has always failed in the United States. And the problem that a problem with a lot of the settler, the writing on settler colonialism I, I see is that it can't account for those failures. It, it, I learn a lot about settlers from settler colonial writing. I, I, it's harder to learn about indigenous and native people through settler colonial theory. Um, it, it's really difficult to tell stories, I, I think, if you're using a set colonial framework, it's difficult to tell stories like Matthew Gilbert tells about the Hopi runners in the 20th century, right? It's really difficult to tell any of the stories that Josh is, is just talking about. And I, I would say that the, the future is, is, I think, in this, these models that indigenous scholars are coming up with themselves. And, and this idea of indigenous future, futurism and, and indigenous futures, 
uh, is, uh, is perhaps one. The, the way that indigenous scholars will come up with their own, the own their explanations about how to understand native history, I think are, are really uh, something to look forward to. I think that the settler, the, my undergraduates and my graduate students love to talk about settler colonialism. They love to invoke that term. And I think the reason they're doing that is they want to show that they understand the United States is an empire and has been an empire. I don't have any problem with that. I'm really glad that they want to address the United States US history that way. I, I don't know if they're always as thoughtful as they need to be about what it means to invoke settler colonialism to signify that. But I think that the US being an empire is something they've become very aware of in their own lives because, and I think that goes back to primarily, goes back to a lot of things, but in their own lives, most immediately for most of my students, it has some connection to the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't believe this, but our time is up. And it's, uh, <laughs> I wanna thank all of our panelists for such a fascinating, engaging conversation. Oh, and there is our Debbie from AHA. Look, I looked at the clock. I paid attention. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to thank our panelists today and everyone who asked questions. It was a really interesting discussion. Um, a recording of the session will be posted on the AHA's YouTube channel soon. And finally, a, a second thanks to our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel and Oxford University Press. Thank you for joining us today.